Hi, and welcome to Global VC Sports and Sport Hiatus Office Hours. It is June 10th, and I'm thrilled to be here with Christine Brennan and Harvey Schiller. Uh, we have an amazing discussion coming up on navigating the sports media landscape for the current normal. We've called it the next normal. We call it the new normal. I've heard it called the next new normal and the new new normal. So uh, whatever you, we ultimately end up calling it, it is definitely a, a, a time of change. And uh, I'm excited to be here with, uh, with Christine and Harvey to talk about um, this conversation. I wanted to give a quick uh, introduction and welcome everyone and give a little bit of the re reasoning of, as to why we're here. And then I'll get out of the way fast so that the full hour can be taken up by the amazing conversation that you two shall have. Um, but at, at, a, at a very high level, it is a wild window in our lives uh, between the virus, between protests, between all that's going on in the world. And I simply wanted to take a second to wish everyone well. I hope everyone's safe. We appreciate your being with us. Hopefully to take a moment out of your lives to focus on the sports industry and entrepreneurialism and investing. But it is, it is a crazy time and, and uh, we wish everyone well. Uh, in the balance of work and play and all that is also going on in your life and in your lives. So thank you for being here. Um, by way of big, brief background, we launched um, NYVC Sports in 2011, deep in Parikh at Courtside Ventures. And I sat at a coffee shop and thought, here's this uh, community of entrepreneurs that are in basements of schools doing hackathons and meetups. Here is this group of entrepreneurs, sorry, of investors that are often at retreats um, and in other environments. And here's this group of sports executives, um, which I've, I've been fortunate enough to be in for very few years since I like to think I'm still young. And we meet up at sports business journal conferences and major dual sporting events. And these three groups don't overlap as much as they should. And I was moving back to New York to work for Major League Baseball. And I thought, if we don't build this community, somebody will, so why, don't, why not do it? The biggest exit at the time uh, I think they were both by eBay. One was GSI and one was, was StubHub. So we thought, let's bring these groups together. Um, we'll fund it. We'll do it on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night. We'll serve some beers and a little bit of food and everyone will network. And if we can produce amazing networking and amazing content, then who knows what this community will become. And over the last nine years or so, we've launched San Francisco VC Sports, Boston VC Sports, and London VC Sports, which fast forwards to 2020. On March 11th, um, Adam Silver, um, temporarily paused the NBA season um, and we began the sport hiatus and so it was our intention during a lot of news that was coming out many much of it positive much of it negative in fact much more of it negative to celebrate all of the creativity all of the innovation all of the thought leadership everything new different exciting there is a sport hiatus how do we celebrate the best of the best and new great things that will come out of this uh, and we launched Sport Hatus on, on June 12th, and we've been doing these weekly office hours since. So that is why we're here. We've got a, a, a great one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation today. If you want to tweet um, at Sport Hiatus or at Global VC Sports are the, are the hashtags. We've put a little uh, fun link in the corner saying Global Tip Jar, which is how we uh, fund a lot of this stuff. So feel free to have some fun there. But with that, um, I want a quick we read a quick bio on, on, on our, our great panelists and hang out of the way. So welcome, Christine, and welcome, Harvey. Um, Christine is an award-winning, if you're here, by the way, you know this, so I'm just giving you the intro. Um, the, these two people are as accomplished as they are in the industry, and, and uh, they, their, their bios speak for themselves. So um, I'm honored to be able to, 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 to touch on them in a very brief way. Christine is an award-winning national sports columnist for USA Today, a commentator for CNN, ABC News, PBS NewsHour, National Public Radio, and a best-selling author and nationally known speaker. Uh, named one of the country's top 10 sports columnists by the Associated Press Sports Editors three times. Uh, she has covered the last 18 Olympic Games, summer and winter. In March 2020, Christine was named the winner of the prestigious Red Smith Award, presented annually to a person who has made, quote, major contribution, contributions to sports journalism. That is an amazing bio. And congratulations and thank you and welcome. Really appreciate you being here, Christine. And Brigadier General Harvey Schiller, U.S. Air Force retired and PhD, is the chairman of Diversified Research, Diversified Search, advisor to Sale GP, chairman to Sports Grid, CSMG, Charlestown Holdings, and Harvey was previously the chairman of uh, Yankees Nets, president of Turner Sports 
Commissioner of America's Cup 35, Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, Executive Director of the USOC, and he served as a pilot in the US Armed Force, including service as a permanent professor at the US Air Force Academy. What an amazing bios, what accomplished individuals you both are. Thrilled to have you here. I'm gonna get out of the way and let you guys enjoy a great conversation. I'll come back at the very end uh, to, 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 to properly thank you. So with that, Christine and Harvey, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, welcome everybody. And Harvey, it's great to see you. We go back a long way, as you were reminding me, uh, I, I thought it was the US Olympic Committee when you were in charge of that, and I was the beat writer for the Washington Post, uh, but it was even earlier than that. We met in Havana, Cuba, on a USA Cuba boxing trip in 1983. And so uh, just a few- It was Evander Holyfield's first international trip, actually. Right. And first time I'd ever been to Havana and, and Cuba, it was very exciting as a young journalist to go down there. And, and we actually uh, were around Fidel Castro and uh, just uh, sports and culture mixing uh, in, a, in a huge way back then. And here we are again, Harvey, uh, with the same kind of conversation. And uh, so what I was thinking we would do here is I'll ask Harvey some questions, we'll have a conversation. And we certainly encourage, I know Jeff encourages as well, uh, participation from all of you out there. So please feel free to uh, get in touch with questions and we will, we will certainly take some of those as well. So uh, without um, you know, waiting another second, Harvey, let's just charge right in here. I think, um, I think it's, it's safe to say we are in extraordinary times. And uh, when you look at this triple whammy of events that we have, heartbreaking and, and so difficult and so important in our country, you know, we've had, of course, the pandemic and the national and of course, international shutdown uh, we've had the uh, cratering of our economy and, of course, the shutdown of, of, of our economy and, and worldwide economies. And, of course, now protests in the United States, the likes of which we perhaps have never seen and certainly not since 1968. So, uh, Harvey, how are sports doing in the midst of all this? Well, I, I wish we all could know. I mean, there's so many unknowns about everything from when professional leagues and college and backyard and amateur and just so many young people trying to participate and go forward and, and do the kind of things they enjoy. I, I think hopefully there are answers ahead for all the things that you've mentioned. I think coming together at this point is probably not a bad idea. I would think that if a pandemic hit and then sometime down the road, there were the, uh, I, the whole talk about diversity and everything else that are on everybody's mind, uh, Perhaps now it's, it's something that we can try to treat in its entirety. And I think sport has an obligation to try to do the best job to do that. Some of it is coming back, but some, most of it is participation. And, and I think just on a personal basis, those that are involved in the leadership of sport are going to have to think about how they present what they do and how they do it in a better way, because most of the things that happen are still going to be at home for a long time. And how, how does Major League Baseball or the NBA or college sports or uh, Little League get into the home in the future? I think that's the biggest challenge. You see uh, then spectator the sports, which by the way, I, I also see, I think probably almost everyone watching and listening right now sees that. Uh, do you see spectator list sports throughout our sports? Uh, do you see, I know there are NASCAR is talking about having some fans come back. But when you look at golf, of course, which was social distancing before there was social distancing. Uh, and then of course you take it all the way to our beloved college football and pro football and 80,000 or 60,000 or 100,000 people in the stands. Uh, what do you make of that? You mentioned that, how do we bring it into the home? Is it going to be almost entirely spectatorless, Harvey, for uh, the, for the foreseeable future? Well, I'm reminded that when Ted, Ted Turner acquired professional wrestling, he only had a hundred fans and in the building and he made it look like there were thousands there. So there's other ways to broadcast. And certainly theatrics does a very, very good job of that, how they, how they tell stories. And I think that's gonna be part of it. I think the college world may be the first one to draw in some significant number of fans. As students come back to campus, you have a younger population, which is not as exposed to the pandemic you have, and maybe more risk oriented. Uh, and they're in a captured environment you know, it could be your home campus of Northwestern, or it could be uh, something like Duke or UCLA where the students are there. 
and how and you're not going to put a hundred thousand people in the stadium, but maybe you'll put twenty five thousand. And and it's also part of the things you mentioned. Those are the young people that are protesting and say, making the statements today as well. So it's a good opportunity for them to have their voice heard in that environment. And I think that's what people want to uh, want to be part of. So I think the college world may be first, and the professionals will follow. And and I don't see large numbers in the professional sports, with the exception of those individual sports like boxing and mixed martial arts and some of the other, and golf, as you mentioned, which is, and, and NASCAR and Formula One and, and Salem, which, which I'm part of. And, and I think those have a chance to be successful in a different kind of way. You watch the uh, the golf of Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Tiger and Phil golf. Yeah. What did, what did you learn from that in terms of not, not golf shots, <laughs> uh, not playing in the rain, uh, not the, the, the fun banter and all that, but what did you learn as a sports executive from watching that in terms of the pathway for the future? Did you learn anything at all on that, from that? I, I remember years ago, I read a piece from, I can't remember who wrote it about marketing, and he said, to draw attention of the public, you have to have two things going for you. One, you have to be the best. And they certainly had the best golfers. They certainly had the best football players, didn't matter on a golf course but you have to be popular and popularity always trumps the best, you know, picking on, you know, the, our public television may have the best programming, but it's may not be as popular as something that's more popular that the Kardashians who may not be good at anything, but it doesn't matter. So I think they, they were able to mix the, both of those. They had the best golfer and they had people that were very popular that I think the public wanted to hear from. I think one of the things that I was taken back on though was there are over 110 million television homes in America and they did have a good rating. I think the cable rating on Turner was had about five, almost 6 million people watching. I'm always wondering what are the other 320 million people doing? How do you draw those people of interest? Because they're doing other things now, you know, maybe jigsaw puzzles or other things in the home, but how do, how do the broadcasters bring them back in large numbers. That's the challenge. Well, that's a good segue into what's going on with baseball. It, and of course, all our sports too, but especially baseball, Major League Baseball right now. You know, the, the idea here is if you don't have it and all of a sudden you realize you can live without it, <laughs> then maybe you really can live without it. Obviously, Major League Baseball has been our national pastime for years. As a girl growing up in Toledo, we had season tickets with the Toledo Mud Hens, went up to Detroit Tigers games. My dad uh, you know, took us to White Sox games. We visited my grandmother in Chicago and grandfather in Chicago. So I love baseball. And I live, I'm here in, of course, Washington, D.C., which uh, at this rate, the Nationals may be the defending World Series champions for quite some time. But what's the danger for Major League Baseball, Harvey, uh, if, if, there is, if they continue to have this, this, this battle um, over the contract and money uh, in terms of what you just said? Do people just move on, especially noting the demographics of baseball already are troublesome? Because of course, so many kids are not are not going to sit through a three and a half hour, three hour, whatever baseball game. Well, I certainly hope people like you and I. I mean, I grew up. I worked at Ebbets Field for the Dodgers. I could walk from my high school to the stadium when I was uh, sixteen or seventeen years old. But I, I think baseball will be back, and I think it'll be a slow migration back of fans. One of the things that baseball has always had in its favor that they've always been in the newspapers every day, three hundred sixty-five days a year. Well, as newspapers fade away and we go more into the digital world, they have baseball has to take full advantage of that to get out to the public. So they have to get to a younger population. And they know, Rob Manfred, the commissioner, and others know that it's a more diverse population as well. There's a whole new group of immigrants into the United States that didn't grow up with baseball. And that group has to be brought into the game. So in some ways, they have some advantages because they're working for almost ground zero to do this. In other ways, as you suggest, uh, there'll be other diversions that are gonna occur. And we have to be able to bring the younger population in. And as families are living at home now, and their younger populations, whether they're extremely young or teenagers or college kids that are back home or siblings, you know, they're looking for short form entertainment they're not gonna sit through four hours of a baseball game and watch it. So baseball has to make some changes as well to be more current and offer things. And I think they can do that through broadcast, which I mentioned earlier, be more entertaining, more theatrical. I think they can do it. 
you could have like a whole sh soft shoe routine in between every pitch for some of these pitchers. Um. <laughs> well, I, I think you brought up a good point. I think gambling will play into that. People don't like to hear about it in major sports, but I think those that offer betting will play into the game to make it more interesting for them. You know, is the next fix you want to be a strike or what is the count or who, you know, what are the percentages? Those kind of things will play into the data and the statistics in a very well, which will enhance the viewing part of the game. And, and I know that, uh, you know, one of the companies I'm associated with, the sports grid, is already talking about those kind of things. Well, sure. And it's all, it's all on this. Yeah, all mobile. At a, so, at, right? At an ads game, not me personally, but a fan, because I'm not going to bet on any of this, but as a journalist, but... Um, and you're sitting there and you're watching Max uh, Scherzer pitch and you're you're betting right then on is it going to be a strike and then the next pitch right or well, that's, that's exchange betting you're absolutely right and it's you know you can break the game down it's not a matter of who wins or loses but take the different parts and do it and I, I think that's the way it is that's the way it's going to be to be able to bring in that uh, the more diverse grouping of people by age and ethnicity and everything else what happens if baseball doesn't play this year? Or maybe a better way to ask it, is baseball definitely going to be figure out a, a way to play at least uh, some semblance of a season this year? Well, I read something this morning where the union has come back with a proposal. They're, they're, they're meeting their minds in terms of whether it's 75 games or 89 games or something in between. I think they'll back us. It's in the best interest of all. You know, uh, the financial challenges that they will face because of loss of revenue from ticketing hopefully can be made up in broadcast. But I think the next big challenge is going to be advertisers. Because if you watch advertising on traditional linear television today, or even in the streaming and digital world, it's telling something about what's happening. It's almost like a public service announcement. They haven't been pushing their products that hard, except on a local basis, car dealers and others. So how do the advertisers and the sponsors tell their story in this new world that we're facing? And how do, they get, how do they become part of that? So the people that are involved in sales for the networks and sales for baseball and sales for the teams are really going to be the winners or losers in this whole thing going forward. You see over time, Harvey, even more corporate sponsorship on the uniform, the way we've seen it, of course, with soccer, men's soccer in particular, the WNBA, where you literally have LifeLock or whatever it is on the uniform, even in baseball. I think it'll be slower in baseball more than any other sport. Obviously, the basketball has been attempting to do it and doing it on a local basis. I think baseball may be the, one of the last. I mean, the Yankees still don't have names on their <laughs> uniforms. And, you know, just take away the pinstripes and somebody will kill you. So I think it'll be slow in that sport. But I don't think it'll be, a, you know, look at golf, for example, as we watch it or a, a car in NASCAR. So the revolution already tells you something that took place. Uh, it, if it fits, okay. In some cases it won't, but that means that baseball and football and some of the others will have to do other things to prevent, to give the sponsor a chance to act, you know, put their, their whatever they have in front of a broadcast because they're losing the fans in the stadium somehow. Yeah, well, you mentioned other things. Do you have any idea what those other things might be? Well, it'll be, probably be things like enhanced screens, which you know ESPN has tried in the past with soccer when they didn't have any real timeouts. I think it'll be those kind of things. It'll be picture in picture, and you know all the technical things that people can do. And as you you mentioned, everybody is on a second screen, so they're watching, but they have their handheld device, or they're watching their iPad, and they have another device, or multiple devices in some cases. Uh, I think those that's how you enhance it. So, you know, most of the groups that I work with have an app and that app is can do certain things that you can't do in regular broadcast in terms of data and exactly what's happening. Sailing, sail GP is, is a great example of that, how they tell stories as it's going along. Baseball will have to do that. They, most of the broadcasters try to do that already. The NFL has done it with uh, statistics and other things. So I, I think that enhanced broadcast, and this is not a surprise to the broadcasters. They know this already. They've been planning for this. Not without, not because of the pandemic, just because that's what the public wants. That's what they have to do. I'm sorry. That's what they have to do. They have to do it. Mm -hmm. So speaking of what the public wants, I was having a conversation with a good friend who was a former editor uh, and work, I worked with 
for many years at the Washington Post, just kind of musing about what all this looks like in a couple of years. And one thought was about these huge contracts. You know, as we are celebrating the first, the people on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, uh, obviously the teachers, the delivery people, um, people who are in the grocery stores even, you know, just being there for those, those of us can go and get, get things that we need. Uh, as we've celebrated all that, and as our country really has embraced that, obviously necessarily and, and so, and also of, of course, you know, we should absolutely responsibly so. You start to think of these huge contracts and America's stomach for that. Now, this is this is more, this isn't a necessarily nuts and bolts question, Harvey, because it's something like that could really be more of a feeling or a sense in the country. But are we going to, as a collectively, as a as a culture, step back in a couple of years and say, why is the school teacher still making 50, 60,000, whatever? And why is a baseball player making 300 million? Do you see us getting to that point or is the opposite the case where we will, we're living it now, but as good Americans, we'll just start charging ahead and we won't become forgetful, but we will move back to what the new, the, the old normal was will become our new normal. Uh, and, and we'll kind of settle back into the fact, the realization that, that these, these salaries are just gonna be so different and, and we will accept that. Any thoughts on that topic? Well, I think, you know, I don't think we're a socialistic country yet. I don't think it's gonna happen across the board, um, but I, I think it's supply and demand. So, you know, you pay big price for a designated hitter or a pitcher or a quarterback or, you know, a shooting guard in basketball based upon their abilities and because there isn't much competition beyond them. And that's one of the challenges we have right now. If we take away a couple of years of development of young people into the game, then ownership of professional franchises and even the college world is going to have a harder time finding people to fill, fit the bill of playing the game. But if you're going to, if you, if we don't develop the game across more of America, we live in an urban society and we we're moving away from a rural economy. So I think that that's important that we give young people a chance to participate. So, you know, if we had a thousand pitchers that could throw a 95 mile an hour fastball, you're not going to make a hundred million dollars because, and that's what's happened in the entertainment industry. You know, you want to be on Broadway, you don't make a lot of money because there are a lot of people that are willing to act or dance or sing right next to you. And, and in your industry, you know, the best go to the top. There are a lot of writers. I think there'll be dramatic changes in that part as pullback and who survives and whether people can do it on their own and supplement and be part of the second screen world in what they write about and how they do it. Uh, there've been attempts at that in the past. We'll see if they're successful in the future. You know, when we talk about this year and, and it's a, a lost year or lost season for so many high school athletes, it's heartbreaking. You know, you think about them. I mean, also the, the kids who just found out they had the lead in the school musical, right? Missing all the graduations. College kids, those those uh, men's and women's basketball teams that were gonna be in the in the tournament and all of a sudden it just abruptly ends. Uh, of course, again, graduations and all the spring sports, although the colleges are talking, you know, giving a chance for some of these uh, student athletes to come back again, but but it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's it's not, it's, you know, there's death and, and the horrors of that that are at a category that are by themselves and, and just awful. But when we bring it to the sports conversation that we're having now, it is heartbreaking for these young people, these young athletes. And then you think of the kids who are gonna make a big break in their respective pro leagues, right? A minor leaguer who was hoping to maybe have a shot at making the majors this year. And if that's, that's gone, at least for now, and of course next year, yes, but you're gonna have a whole new crop of young people who have basically two years worth, right? In so many ways, uh, trying to make it, whether it's the WNBA, the NBA, the Major League Baseball, et cetera. Do you, do you think about those young people, those that have lost this, time in sports, uh, do you, when you do think about them, what, what comes to mind? Well, as I said earlier, it's all about participation, but I, I think if you include all the professional leagues, men, male and female, you know, whether it's soccer, basketball, football, whatever it is, you know, how many total professional athletes at that level do you have? Three to 4,000, something like that. So really we should be urging our young people to be educated and participate in sports as part of that education. 
and take advantage of opportunities. You're probably going to make more money working in Silicon Valley than you are trying to be a professional athlete. So I, I, I think, you know, the message is clear and I think it's maybe even a better message. Be prepared for what else is out there. You know, it's just not going to be a career of sports and it's not going to be, you're not going to be, even after sports, you're not going to be a major broadcaster compared to everybody else. You know, what else are you going to do in life? Uh, and the challenge will always remain. That's the way it's been in the past. Some people are genetically gifted. We can train as hard and hard. I remember from analysis when I was with the Olympic Committee, you know, you really need some of this genetic makeup to be able to participate at that level. And you can train as hard as you want and you will be a high end athlete. But clearly, you know, we can pick apart Lance Armstrong. We'll probably get into him. You know, he, unfortunately he cheated, which is not, but he had the genetic makeup to be a great athlete. I mean, he won the world's cycling championship probably without, without drugs. I don't know. But when he got into the tour de France, it was different, but his genetic makeup is different. You know, his lung capacity, his muscle structure, all the other things, and, and his fi the fibers that are in his legs. So those people will still be able to participate at the highest level. But we ought to make sure that other people are educated and prepared for whatever life is going to give them. I do want to talk about some specific athletes and also, of course, about the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee and the Olympic Games. Um, but since we're talking about the missed year or the missed chunk of a year for these athletes, uh, I was talking with Bob Bowman, of course, uh, the great swimming coach, Michael Phelps's coach, and uh, we were chatting about once the Olympics were postponed from 2020 to 2021, and certainly we'll see if they actually do happen in 2021, but of course we all hope that they do. Um, I said, what are you going to learn as these athletes are missing this valuable time, and how, how long can they go, these the best swimmers in the world, how long can they go before it's going to be detrimental to their performances at the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. And Bob Bowman, uh, Michael Phelps, of course, is retired, but he works with uh, Allison Schmidt and others, said to me, he goes, I think you can go till November with some kind of spotty training until to, to really then gear up for, for July of 2021. So he thought there's time built in here, um, that they're not losing as much time as you might think right now. Uh, and in fact, he said, and I've heard others say this too, Harvey, and this is, here's my question for you after this long preamble, <laughs> um, is there benefit? As, as Bob Bowman said, he goes, we've never had top athletes like this take time off and just stop. And he goes, I'm wondering what this is going to look like. Uh, people who've had injuries and have just plowed through them. And of course, every athlete has some kind of injury, right? Um, and maybe it was just a little thing. Maybe it's just getting the, the, the muscle healthy, the knee healthy, the shoulder healthy again. Um, have you thought about that? The positives, strangely enough, in the midst of the time off that these top elite athletes uh, have been forced to take? Well, look at Dara Torres. A great example of off, taking off time and in her 40s winning medal in the 50 meter. You know, and I think it, I think it could be beneficial. I, I think the biggest challenge is going to be those athletes for the example of the United States Olympic and Paralympic team that had been chosen already through qualifiers and other tests who are injured and can't participate next year, but they're still an Olympian, a member of the Olympic team. Do they hold that position? Does someone else take their place? I think that's going to be something that we have to, that those who are in charge are going to have to challenge, but how I'm not an expert at this. I don't know how long it takes. Bob Bowman would know to get to your peak performance probably resting is better for right now. I, I would hope that those great athletes have a chance to demonstrate to the world how good they are and not lose that because of a year. And, but that exists in every sport, not just the Olympic games, right? So Absolutely. I, maybe, maybe it's better for a pitcher to take off three or four months than to be pitching. That's not what the history has said. It said something different in terms of batting and hand-eye or coordination. Do you, do you lose it? Do you come back to it? You know, sports scientists have studied this stuff for a long, long time. And it seems to be that there's always a benefit of training, continual training. Maybe with kids, uh, you know, the, the kids who go year round on, at, with one single sport, maybe there is some benefit in taking some time off for a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, with the, you know, especially in the uh, preteen or teenage years. Let's, let's go to the Olympics, something uh, that you and I both love very much. 
I've covered them since 1984. You've been involved in the Olympic movement for years. You were running the U.S. Olympic Committee when it was called the U.S. OC. Now, of course, it is called the U.S. OPC. Will there be an Olympic Games in 2021, do you think? I would hope so. I, th I believe that a lot will depend upon transportation. Will people be able to come to, you know, we're, the United States is one of the largest ticket buyers of the games winter and summer. It could be that we'll see more Asian people in the stands than we've seen before because of some of that. It may look a little bit different. I hope that the games go on for next year. I hope the cycle is not lost. If it is, uh, be a pretty dramatic change to the Olympic world as we know it. We went to the two year cycle between summer and winter games, mainly because of sponsorships and television and how much money there was in the marketplace. It may be that we have to go back to the quadrennial games, winter and summer in the same year. That could happen. Do you see a scenario in which international travel has not yet come back? You know, we don't know, obviously. It's a, we're talking now 13 months from now. But since we are, you know, using our crystal ball here in many ways, and thank you again for, for your time and entertaining all these questions, Harvey. Uh, if, if it's hard to travel, if international travel is difficult, and if in fact there is concern still, as you mentioned, Tokyo, uh, throughout Asia, uh, potentially of, of the spread, now we're hoping there's a vaccine. So again, if, 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 just kind of playing this out, this hypothetical, could you see a scenario where it's mostly, again, spectator list or, or social distancing in the stands? Because at the end of the day, the Olympic games are a TV show. Not for you or me, lucky enough to be there, but for the, the vast majority of people. And when I was growing up, you know, eight to 11 on ABC, you got home at 8.15 and you missed the first 15 minutes because there was no way to tape it. Um, and it's a TV show and could they pull it off? And would the networks even want that, desperately want that because they, they really have to have an Olympics, right? Do you see a scenario where this could play out with some social distancing and or even maybe fan, not having fans in the stands? It's been talked about for a long time. I mean, there are, in the movie Rollerball was an event with there were really no fans watching what was going on. The fans are about the experience for them. We're putting too much emphasis on the experience for the performer, for the athlete at the game. I don't believe that a batter at the plate is thinking a lot about the fans in the stadium when a 90 mile an hour fastball is coming up. And I don't think the same for a down lineman or a quarterback or a receiver or someone taking a jump shot. You know, the NBA is trying to come back at Disney World and do something without fans. I think we rely too much on this whole idea that we need fans in the stands. We need them for revenue. Sure. <clears throat> do we need them to play the game? Probably not. You mentioned, again, we've talked about golf and, and NASCAR. Fans are certainly a nice <clears throat> add to it but I don't think it's gonna impede the games in the future. Now travel for events and qualifications, you know, you wanna match yourself up against the best in the world. So if you're a track athlete, you just don't want it that one time that you appear in Tokyo where you're running hundred meters. You wanna be able to participate against other athletes in another environment. And that's about travel, that's not about fans. How do you create that financially that it's advantageous to the venue to put on that particular event to bring those players together. That's the real challenge. Well, and your, your point is well taken. I mean, how many golf tournaments do you turn on and you see literally no one standing around the green? If it's not Tiger or Phil or whomever. Uh, the Athens Olympics, you know, it's kind of a joke that 2004, which I love the Athens Olympics, but because it was the first summer Olympics after 9-11. First Winter Olympics, of course, were Salt Lake City run by Mitt Romney, but the first summer games were uh, then three years later in, in Athens. And, and there were empty stadiums because so many people did not want to travel because of the threat of terrorism going to that part of the world in Athens, Greece. Do you, you, you know, you love figure skating and gymnastics. Do you think the figure skater cares how many people, they probably like when the applause occurs, but they're performing to their best, right? No, and in fact, as you know, um, both of those, well, gymnastics is, is other than, of course, the, the terrible, terrible Larry Nassar horrors. But in terms of the support of the spectator sport of gymnastics, uh, it has never been, um, it's never been better. And the college, you know, right, they sell out at Georgia and UCLA and K 
Caitlin and Ohashi and all the all of them. So again, not not minimizing Larry Nasser. It's just a, we're talking about the spectator side here. Figure skating though has had the exact opposite. It is really, really um, from. I mean, there's nowhere to go from down after you have a 48.5 rating for the uh, short program in Lillehammer, Norway. You know it well in 1994 during the Tanya Nancy story. I know it real well because you gave me a forearm shiver and Mike Moran in the. I know what really people, people don't even know what you're talking about, Harvey, but it's a complete opposite. I was doing my job, but that's okay. Um, it was a two in the morning press conference where you guys, the US Olympic Committee announced. We announced that Tanya would skate. Exactly. And that's all I said. I just said, Tanya will skate. And the you house reporters in there said, you gotta say something else. And we just, I just walked out, so. Yeah. Right, right. And, and as any good journalist would, I wanted to ask you more questions. But you didn't have to be physical about it. Here we go. I was not physical, Harvey. Anyway, um, the but you know, so you consider you know all all of these you know in figure skating. There was nowhere to go but down, of course, right? Forty eight point five rating. So skating actually, the skaters are used to not having too many people in the stands, unfortunately. Um, and I know you. We, we talked a week or so ago. You felt strongly that you know maybe these are sports that you could literally do on Zoom, right? You can't have a competition. Um, on Zoom with like with instead of because you can't. It's going to be very hard to travel to for the skaters to travel to Skate America or Skate Canada or Russia and compete, but maybe they all compete in an empty arena with the Zoom camera on and then the judges are all watching. It sounds weird. It sounds like something right out of the future, but maybe this is where we are. It all has to fit, you know, which I said earlier, to be able to have that event, you have to have the financial resources to do it. Bring, even, to, even if it's just the arena and the skaters and, and the broadcast. So that means the advertisers have to buy in which means the public has to watch it to be of value. So those, those components have to work. The hardest working people going forward are not gonna be the athletes on, in the arena or on the ice or the cameramen. It's gonna be those darn salespeople that have to sell the advertising. I mean, they're, they're, they're the ones, their lives are dependent upon it. And you know, every network only cares about feeding their children. They're not feeding the other network's children. Luckily, you have big corporations like Disney and Comcast behind the scenes that, although they suffer from other things as well, uh, be able to support the financial resources that are necessary to keep those broadcasters alive right now. But we're seeing the transition between traditional linear broadcast and the digital world. And as, as young people migrate more to streaming and other things, and now the competition is so large that you have limited resources at home. Do you pick Netflix or Prime or Hulu or anything else, um, and whether it's Peacock or one of the other Disney Plus, I'm not sure how many of those are going to survive going forward. They're only going to survive if they have the best content and bring the best advertisers with them, or or at no advertising. I mean, uh, one of the things you have in pay per view and boxing is you have no advertising, and maybe even few fans in MMA or something like that. But the broadcasting value for pay-per-view is so significant that some of these people are making hundreds of millions of dollars, more than any other professional baseball or basketball player. Well, we're still in the Olympics, Harvey, and we'll get to some questions. I'm getting them on my phone here, so we'll get to those in a couple of minutes. While we're still in the Olympics, in the wake of the, uh, the George Floyd murder, death, uh, and uh, of course the resulting um, protests and and the poll numbers that are extraordinary, such a, a change and, and so heartening that we're having this conversation and so important that we are. Obviously, I'm not doing it justice here. It's, it's, uh, it is uh, watershed and, and hopefully historic in all ways to, in this country um, on the issue of racism, pre police brutality, uh, Black Lives Matter, so many other uh, important issues here. Uh, do you believe that we will see athletes protesting at the Olympic Games on the medal stand next year. I don't, I'm not sure I'll use the word protest. If protest means making a statement, I think they'll do whatever they can do depending on who they are and what they represent. But I don't think that they will try to destroy or take away from that moment. I think that's inherent. You know, when you, <clears throat> I remember uh, Jesse Owens said, when that flag flies higher than all others, you would have said to yourself, if I knew how good it was going to feel, I would have tried even harder. So I think for that moment, if you're the Olympic athlete and you're striving to win that gold medal and defeat all of your opponents, you know, uh, 
you may you may make a statement as part of that and i wouldn't take that away from anyone but it's that you have to describe that to yourself what you want that moment to be you know it, it's what your moment of victory is if your moment of victory is to share that moment with billions of people around the world to make a statement and that that's what you want to do and and i think people will do it different ways in the future you know they and i think the people that put together the award ceremony are going to have to change as well. You know, we, we, what we've done in the past or what we've done up until today is we said, okay, you stand here, the flag goes up, we're going to play the national anthem and don't move. I think it's going to be different. It may be, so? Maybe How the so? award ceremony includes you can make any statement you want. Maybe that's what you change. You change the environment around it so that Christine Brennan wins the gold medal in figure skating. And I'd like to say something on behalf of George Floyd. I'd like to say something on behalf of, this is really important to me. And then the ceremony goes on in the flag or whatever is, people may not want flags in the future. They may want something different. So it's up to the organizers, the International Olympic Committee to talk to the National Olympic Committees to come back with something which doesn't have to replicate everything. It's, it's a new beginning for the world here. That's what protesters are sort of saying, right? We've lived with this too long. And, and people are focusing on, you know, lots of things right now as a way of making a statement. Policemen are kneeling with other people in, in, in different venues around America. And people around the world are duplicating it. You know, you have to decide which is the best way you want to make a statement about your, who you are and what you stand for. And, and I think we've been too strict on some of the things. So we have to make some change. And, and corporations that don't change will fail. And they do it in lots of different ways. So, you know, McDonald's will come up with a new product because it has to meet the needs of the public. Well, the IOC and professional sports have to come up with a slightly different product. And it has to look a little bit different. It doesn't mean that you changed 100 meters to 110 meters. It just means that you're doing something beyond that particular event. You want to be able to measure people against the past. And, you know, you're, that's important. You don't want to come out with a new baseball uh, or, or have less air in a football. You may want to do different things. No, oh, that less air in the football has been tried before. Anyway, um, going back to... Uh, um, the protesting. Do you expect to see Roger Goodell taking a knee uh, if there is football this fall? I mean, in the suite that he's sitting in? Good one. On the field. <laughs> I mean, he'll have to take a knee. think he's going to run down the field? I think he may go down on the field and walk down and shake the hand of the players who are making a statement. You know, I just said that the IOC may have to make a change. You, you know better than me, but the history of this anthem at the games only came because the Department of Defense was buying time and advertising, right? Other than that, the team stayed in the locker room and came out after the, and broadcasters never even had the anthem on. And, you know, it, it, they do in certain sports, but they didn't in, in, the, in football, in National Football League. I hope, be, you know, I'm a retired military person. I've served my country for many, many years. I believe very strongly in America. I believe everything that we do going forward should help to strengthen that for the future of all the people that live in this country or want to come here. Well, and of course, thank you for your service. I mean that wholeheartedly uh, in Vietnam. And um, the uh, Goodell did say that he will protest. I protest with you. And I, I wrote a column uh, that Friday night saying, I think that means he's going to take a knee. Um, I think we're going to see massive, massive uh, silent, peaceful protests, as Colin Kaepernick uh, showed the way. Uh, on, in the end, you know, I'm going to interrupt you a second there because I know Roger. He'll do more than take a knee. Roger is he will do things with the NFL to make it better. And, and taking the knee is certainly an act, but you got to do other things. I mean, we have to do a lot of things to make it better for every American. And and. He will be part of that. So what about Kaepernick? Are you surprised that he has not been signed, whether it was a year or so ago after that workout where he looked good, or even since Friday night? Are you surprised he hasn't been signed? 
Well, he's a lot older now. I'm not sure how well he can. No, he's 32. He's not that old. Yeah, well, there are there are 28 year olds that aren't there anymore. You know, I I I leave that up to GMs and the owners. I've always my experience has been, if you can help me win, I'll sign you. If you can help my team win, I'm okay with you. I'll, you know, if Dennis Rodman could make rebounds, he'll play for the Bulls. You know, forget about all this other stuff. If he's that good enough athlete, I'll sign him. Take all the, all everything that he, at that end of it, he or she comes with. And if he can win for someone, they'll sign him. I can't make that determination. I don't, I can't, I don't know how good a player is now or was others will make it, you know, uh, Jerry Jones had positive statements about him at the time, but he wasn't the quarterback that he wanted for his team. So you don't think Harvey that, that Colin Kaepernick was blackballed? No, I don't. I really don't. Even though teams were signing people like Jay Cutler who had been retired. He's good enough to win. They've taken no, <laughs> they have they have people that work good enough to win. I mean, if they're good enough to win, and if you're not good enough to win, especially in the NFL, remember Tom Landry would come in a flashlight at five or six o'clock in the morning and shine in your face and say you're going home. Well, that's all the, that's the way you live in that world. You either can win for me or you can't. You know, this is not the NFL is not sandlot baseball or football. And I can't speak for the owners or the GMs, but I, if I was a general manager and he and, and those players could win for me, I would sign. Them. Now, winning, winning is a complex thing. Is that winning includes our, can they bring the team together, right? That has to be evaluated by people. I'm not sure that's part of blackballing, but I think people may argue this, but I've seen teams where great, great athletes have been brought into the team and the team comes apart. Not part of protesting, just who they are in the locker room. That's not uncommon. And and teams have waved them goodbye, regardless of how good a player they were, because they just didn't have that syncrasy and that what you need to blend to bring a team together to win. You know, hockey goes through that all the time. Great, great players. And do they fit into that line that they can play together? Okay, but one more here, and then we'll move on to another topic. So the NFL is part of American society. The NFL exists in our culture. You, were, you have been a leader of many, many organizations. Do you not think that it would be beneficial today to have Colin Kaepernick on a roster working with the NFL during this most fraught time involving race relations in our country? Maybe there's another place for him. If he can play, play him. If he can't play, like they do in a lot of teams, make him a coach or a spokesman or whatever you want to do, or put him on the sideline to, to be there, to be inspirational. There's a thousand things you can do which are done in sports all of the time. People so are you are, surprised? Like, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like, it reminds me of, you know, colleges that will recruit somebody's best friend to get the person to sit on the bench with him. You know, that, that's not unusual. If he can win, I truly believe that he'll, he, they'll put him on the field. And you know what? I'd like to believe that. I don't, if I'm him, I don't want to be on the field if I can't win. But I'd like to be part of a team. Sure. I think there should be plenty of openings for him and others that can bring that diversity and that thought, you know, to help people succeed. Yeah. Yeah. They can help change. It happened. Didn't, didn't something happen? In the, I'm, I'm trying to reflect with the, the Dolphins. Way back, there was a confrontation in the locker room. And incognito, Richie incognito. And Steve Ross came in and brought in people to say, OK, let's let's open this up and let's come out with a let's just throw somebody out of the locker room. And let's fix it inside. Right. But Richie incognito got a second, third chance. You know, uh, so that's um, that. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. I'm going to have to think about I think about my cell phone just just dropped and I've got all the questions on the cell phone. So hang on one second. I'll be right back. Here we go. I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, along the lines of protesting, since we're on the topic, should 
the Kansas City Chiefs rid of the tomahawk chop? Should Washington's NFL team get rid of its racist name that I said many times when I was a beat writer for the Washington Post, but I do not say that name, the R word, anymore? Um, and should the Atlanta Braves get also get rid of the tomahawk chop? Well, you know, I used to be part of the Braves. <laughs> and I know your son is, even to this day, president. I have a yes. family member that's there. Uh, I... If, if I was making the decision personally, or should they, you're asking me if they should change. If Harvey Schiller's in charge of the NFL, Major League Baseball, or Washington's NFL team, or Kansas City, or the Atlanta Braves. I would do everything within my power to not be offensive to, to I can't answer that of any individual, but to the general population, Let's not be. Uh, let's not do something that's insulting. So you would you would get rid of them. I would do. I would work with the team to put together whatever is the best way of solving if that was considered to be a problem by the public that they play into. Now, if the fans of of Washington are happy with the Redskins and the greater community is okay with it, I think that's a bigger challenge that they have to make, and I think it has an economic value too. Is it, is it, I have, I don't know enough about the, the sociology of it to, to come up with an answer of whether uh, doing the tomahawk chop at a Braves game is, how is that felt by the uh, native community? I, I you're asking Not me a question. I, I can give you an answer. Not good. I'll tell you who's offended by it. Me. <laughs> it's well, awful. Yeah, you know, it's awful. I'm offended by a lot of things too, and I hope pe people won't change it just because I'm offended. Person. Well, it, it's it's right. You know, you're, you're not going to be a writer, and you're talking to a larger audience, so you have a greater influence over people. That's that's what you do, and that's and I have to read that and decide whether I want to side with you. You know, look, I've been in combat, and I will tell you there are lots of things that are said and done in that environment that would be insulting to the world. If that if that was necessary to defeat the enemy, or protect your fellow service purpose, you do it. Right, but, and I, again, totally, you know, uh, having known each other for what, 35 to 37 years, uh, couldn't respect that more uh, about, you know, your service to our country and, and thank you again. But this is about racism. Um, so uh, anyway, I, uh, um, it'll be very, uh, because it, it's a natural conversation, is it not? To go right from the- part of a, It's part of a conversation and my particular feeling is, is that the owners of these teams have an understanding of what, how the public reacts to them, and they're going to, they're going to do what's in, in their best interest. That's what they're going to do. And, and that goes for the commissioner as well. The commissioner is going to do, look, the commissioner is a commissioner of, uh, of owners. That's the, his, board of, his or her board of directors. Lisa Baird is now with women's soccer. She is... She is the chairman of the board of that group. They're going to beat the hell out of her on a whole number of issues, right? That's what being a, I was a commissioner. That's not at that level, but that's what it's about. And you have to be able to bring that group together like you're running any other business to be successful. Right. And, and that's your job. And you just don't go in and make a specific change under certain circumstances that don't meet other circumstances. That's part of the challenge of being successful. And, and people will be critical of you for making a good this decision or that decision. You have to live with that. Of course, then there is history and how at a crucial watershed moment in our nation's history, how you're viewed. Um, and of course, these leaks will be viewed through that yeah. system as well. No right. doubt about that. Hey, let's get to a few more. Uh, I've got a couple of questions from our audience, uh, which is why I had to step away because my iPhone went bouncing that way for a, a second. Uh, what do you think of the NCAA's uh, decision to permit college athletes to benefit from, of course, their name, image, and likeness. Oh, man, that's going to take another couple of hours. But okay. uh, I think it's it's a major challenge has been seen by athletic directors and conference commissioners on how they answer that particular question. Because uh, what you don't want is buying players to participate. And, you know, the example is given the car dealer in some particular community uh, signs you to to a contract to promote the dealership, but really it's a way of recruiting. You have to avoid that. 
and you have to have some way of protecting the majority of the players, especially for the non-revenue sports that may suffer from it. So they, there are people are looking at solutions, which try to bring some commonality. Can you market everybody together? Is there some value? Do you do things like leagues, but what leagues do where they share licensing revenue together? Uh, but there will there'll always be that one special athlete in every sport at a particular location. And if they can deserve to be paid, but you're not going to be able to pay multiple numbers of people enormous amounts of money. That's just not going to happen. I, I, professionalism has already occurred, it occurred in the Olympics, right? You've been part of it. You've watched that happen in every sport. You know, when we've gone from training expenses to just paying you. And now we have professional basketball players and soon we'll have professional baseball players in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, that's, it's an evolution. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to be an AD right now. I don't know how to answer that question on a specific campus. I'm trying to keep harmony among all my players as I recruit and some young man or young woman shows up and they already have a hundred grand that they're being paid. It's not probably really good for the entire team. Is there some way that they could share that in a different kind of way we'll all be together? Uh, maybe there's a better way of doing that in a licensing environment. Couple more, Harvey. Thank you on that. Um, women's sports, something obviously you care very much about. I care very much about uh, women's sports. Uh, when sports resume, how are women's sports going to do? I, uh, we know, for example, that on college campuses, uh, Title IX, of course, is, I believe, the most important law in our country the last uh, 50 years, 48 years right now. We're almost at the 48th anniversary. Um, and women's sports are here to stay, of course. And they're creating fabulous leaders for our country and wonderful uh, role models, um, you know, millions and millions of women playing sports in our country, leading the way over the next 40, 50, 60 years in our nation. Uh, but we don't, we may well lose. We already are seeing some men's Olympic sports being cut. Uh, will we see women's sports being cut if the uh, economics uh, gets, uh, you know, if, if the economy of these sports and, and these teams and the universities are taking such a hit? And what about women's pro leagues? Uh, are they gonna be able to bounce back uh, at a time when they need so much support, and yet, of course, here they just—we've just had this, you know, broadside uh, in our economy through the pandemic, and of course, uh, the protests as well. Well, at the college level, what we've seen is baseball being cut, and some of the others. I know the women's sport, you know, people will play by the law. So as long as, long as they're uh, it's equal and they're able to play it out some way, you know, I've seen in a few campuses where they've gotten rid of men's and women's tennis, for example, both have disappeared. It's, it'll be challenging for men, it'll be challenging for women. If there are fewer opportunities in sports like baseball and that leads to fewer opportunities in field hockey, then that's not a good situation. At the professional level, it's all about competition. I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be like owning a restaurant. You're gonna survive by being better than your competitor. And women's sports have a special challenge, I think, in succeeding professional sports going forward. Uh, I don't think, I, I think they're actually in a better position at the college level than they will have been in the past from what I read and keep up with. But I think at the professional level, when sports start to come back, what will people decide to watch? In, in whether it's a digital environment or whether it's in a linear environment, and I think, I think women's sports may suffer somewhat from that. The, the tournament that's going on in Utah for women's soccer, I think they came out ahead of others. So I think there'll be some uniqueness to it and hopefully they'll be able to succeed. Those that tail behind the professional leagues coming back will probably suffer. And last one, I'll kind of, I'll get back to the pandemic and, and the issues, you know, of course, uh, we know that sports really signaled the way uh, with, uh, on March 11th, uh, when leadership in this nation was calling the pandemic a hoax and other things, and all of a sudden you've got the NBA, that moment, I think everyone probably remembers where they were when they saw on their phone, right? That the NBA was suspending operations. That was March 11th at about, I think uh, right around 9, 8, 39 o'clock Eastern time um, in the evening. And so the NBA led the way and then the cascading, right? The dominoes fell and everything was basically uh, the NCAA men's and women's tournaments and everything shut down. And now of course the NBA and others are leading the way and opening back up. Um, and as you know, Adam Silver has said, and others have said, we will now deal with positive tests and, move, and keep playing, as opposed to March 11th, positive test, and they shut down. 
So how do you see that playing out, Harvey? Again, I realize you are, you don't have a crystal ball, but then the very stark question that I will ask is uh, how many deaths are acceptable? Do we end up with something called acceptable deaths where not so much players, God, God forbid anyone, but if, they, if there is a coach or a referee or an umpire, I think you know where I'm getting at, and coronavirus does is spiking in different places and it's, you know, these big cities, what happens then? How does this play out when sports come back, but we're still clearly in the midst of a pandemic without a vaccine? It's a horrible question, what we're willing to accept. I know. Except nothing. I mean, you can't, you know, did a professional sport kill me because I came back to it? You know, there are older people that are around all the sports. They work in the locker rooms. They're the referees and the officials. And, you know, they're the ticket takers and the others that work the stadiums. And they're the people that do a lot of things, you know, people willing to wait online to go into a restroom when they're at an arena in the future. But I, I, if something happens in a game, whether it's hockey or basketball or baseball or any game, and a player is injured, the team, the league, and others work together, the professionals, to prevent that injury or that death from occurring in the future. Rules keep changing to do that. So if someone dies because they've been part of coming back because of underlying illnesses, what everybody will work together to prevent that from happening again. Does it mean complete stoppage? I can't answer that. Does it mean better caution? Does it mean more testing? Does it mean we'll wait for a vaccination? So we'll, we'll respond to that, but no one, no fan or individual that's part of a game should feel threatened, their life threatened because they're part of a sport. And, and Adam Silver absolutely made the best decision because his game was going on then, so was hockey. So it, we weren't playing professional football. You know, we weren't playing baseball yet. We had spring training, but we, we you know, the. He, Adam and Gary had people coming back to the arenas every day. They had to do something different. But you know, look, because of my age, I'm in that death range. So, you know, am I willing to give my life to go to a game, you know, just to be there? No, that's not what it's part of. You know, that's so we shouldn't be able, we shouldn't have that as a statistic. We should, if something happens because of it, the decision's made, as I've said just a few minutes ago, you fix it and make sure it doesn't happen again. You take temperatures, you do something, you do better testing, you don't have people around each other, or you stop, whatever. I said that was the last question, but I have to do the postscript. Michael Jordan, I'm sure a lot of people watching us watched Michael Jordan have a few choice words about you. <laughs> Harvey, this is your opportunity to respond. Uh, I know you, you a little bit, but uh, yeah, what, what did you make of that? And here you are thrown back into 92 in Barcelona. I covered it, remember it well. Uh, your thoughts on Michael Jordan's, uh, shall we say derogatory reference to you? One of my foreign students said, Dick is director in charge. So he, he you know, you can look at it that way. I, I didn't know he said it at the time. And uh, since that time, I've made a public statement that that award ceremony was important to that dream team. And my guess is that they all still have their uh, Reebok award uniforms, including Michael Jordan, who put a flag over his. Now, some of the players were sponsored by Reebok at the time. You know, they, they weren't complaining about anything. But I had told the team, no medal ceremony, no medals if you don't wear the warm up, I mean, the award ceremony uniform, because that was with supporting hundreds of athletes that weren't professionals, you know, five or 600 athletes that we had. I've been around Michael Jordan since, his agent is a friend of mine. I haven't, I didn't know that, would I, would, if I see him tomorrow, will I say something to him? No, you know, um, probably one of the best things that anyone ever said about me, that I'm a dick, so not so bad. I've been cursed, sworn at, you know. Oh, as they say, you know, who cares what they say? Better, just... You know, he, he wanted to win. And that's what it, we talked about that. What, do you, what does it take to win? It's a Michael Jordan it takes to win. And he, 
I don't take it away from him. He was defending his position, which he was a Nike athlete. <clears throat> he also, one of the things that didn't come out was that the team uniforms during the competition were champion. He never complained about that. Champion was owned by Sara Lee. Sara Lee owns Haynes underwear. Haynes was a sponsor of Michael Jordan. All comes full circle. Well, as they say, you know, just uh, just spell the name right, right? In terms of the publicity, probably wasn't wasn't bad for you, Harvey. Um, and but you're as I was a beat writer for the Washington Post covering the Olympics, and absolutely, um, everyone else, whatever their lives were like, they they wore those uniforms, and you're that's the sponsorship that is essential um, to to everyone. You, you yeah, we've had, yeah, we've had a few other instances incidents where people did certain things on the. We had a track athlete who had been drafted for a professional team, and during the award ceremony, he put on a hat of the team he was going to. And his coach came to me later and apologized. I said, you don't have to apologize. He said, why? I said, I have his passport. I don't think he's going home. <laughs> Obviously, I gave it back to him. Right, of course. Of course. Well, and, and this is that, that very tenuous relationship that's been going on for years amateurs, the shamisherism, and then of course, uh, the ability of athletes now to make money, of course, thankfully for themselves. Um, and also, of course, that delicate dance between the sponsorships that are so essential to the USOPC and to all national uh, Olympic committees. So it's, uh, yeah, Jordan uh, did not play by the rules at that moment. And um, as, a, as a journalist covering it, uh, no doubt in my mind, that uh, Harvey Schiller, you actually did exactly what you should do, and Jordan was was in the wrong on that one because you just don't do that. If you don't like the rules as an Olympian, which you, by the way, I think a lot of people won't necessarily know this, Harvey. Uh, every athlete signs a, a statement, and and they've agreed to these terms. And so, if Jordan didn't like it, he didn't need to be on on that Olympic team. Sounds ridiculous, obviously, um, and it's a long, long time ago but he knew exactly what the rules were. This didn't show up that day and surprise him that day. And uh, you were, uh, as, uh, as, a, as a journalist covering you, you were absolutely in the right on that and he was wrong on that one. So there you go, my two cents. Anything else, Harvey, before I bring Jeff back in? No, it's, you know, the basic questions about this is so many unknowns. It's just the, the solutions are there, the answers are there, and we all have to work to make sure as you said at the very beginning, it's this very strange time in America for all these things, the world coming together for a lot of reasons. We hope we have a better economy. We hope we have a cure for the virus. And we hope we have a bigger cure for the challenges that we face in our society among each other. How, how we can work better in a brotherhood and a sisterhood together without some of the things that people feel threatened by that some of us have never experienced in our lives. And hopefully that can all change. Well said. Well, thank you. And again, to all be, be uh, healthy and safe. And now I'll throw it back to, uh, to our moderator and our host, Jeff. Well, first of all, um, a smart, honest, real dialogue. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. And it's why we created this um, platform. So truly to both, you, both of you, Christine and Harvey, thank you. That was a fun, spirited, honest, real conversation and that's that's all anyone can ever ask for when you tune in to 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 want to talk about our industry so truly on behalf of all of us thank you thank you um, i wanted to i wanted to say a couple of a quick of quick things there are a number of people that are involved in putting this together thank you to all of our advisory board members thank you to live like for all of the um live blogging and and sentiment analysis and, and polling questions <clears throat> um please um everyone who's on twitter follow C-B-R-E-N-N-A-N -N -N sports. So C Brennan sports, which is Christine's hashtag and she does amazing stuff. So please follow her on Twitter and H.W. Schiller, um, Harvey's Twitter account, two, two great accounts to follow and uh, obviously sport hiatus and, uh, and global VC sports. So please be active. Uh, I promised I wouldn't make this joke, but I'm going to. So. You've got Harvey's Olympic torch over his head and you've got his globe next to him. So I guess the metaphor is that he's lighting the world on fire. I make dad jokes. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. I think I'm, I'm permitted. But, but certainly what I would say is that 
the fact that you guys go back 30 plus years uh, is, is truly a testament for the amazing dialogue and the camaraderie that you guys have had throughout this conversation. And, and I sat here smiling, just enjoying it as a, as, as, as a fan. Uh, so, so truly thank you for that. And then I lastly want to finish up with um, our mission, which I, I try to close up each of our segments with. And that is our goal um, is to provide a platform for people to just celebrate that which is innovative and interesting and exciting during a crazy time in our lives. So please support our leagues, our teams, our athletes, our broadcasters, our publishers, brands, agencies, partners, entrepreneurs, and investors. We are one team. Sports never stop. Fans never stop. Things are starting to come back. Be creative, be innovative, and be safe. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.